the dream of the first night, his head was filled with the distorted chatter of human voices, submerged in a loud and constant electrical hum. Outside his tent, a row of utility poles marched toward the horizon. Climbing to the top of the nearest pole, he cut the wires, and immediately the rocky landscape fell into a startling, profound silence. In his dream, he had made a small tear in the electrical spider web of technology that was spread over the surface world, and this tear beckoned as an entryway to a place where the earth still existed with its enchantments intact. In this silence, everything around him appeared with a new presence. The sweep of the canyon was a view into an open book of secrets whose pages numbered millions of centenarian lifetimes, a record of the telluric ascent of consciousness from layers of Vishnu schist and bright angel shale. This landscape was a book and an open tomb, now violated by light after the retreat of ancient seas had deposited creatures like alphabetic enigmas onto the mineral pages, dying and drying into words. He had come with a question, but he did not know if he would leave with an answer. The puffs of shrubbery scattered over the slopes of soil seemed from the distance like a single organism. Stepping into an enclave surrounded by sentinels of rock, he suddenly felt captured by a strange presentiment. A perceptual reciprocity was taking place making him feel subtly exposed and visible, watched and listened to by the desert. Unseen to him, a lone lizard had opened its eye in the shade of the rock, becoming in that moment the mystic eye and the capstone of the pyramid of matter. An English-speaking homunculus lived inside his head, talking almost constantly. He wondered if this language by which he knew himself and the world had become a cage. Long ago there had been people who had looked at these desert forms and heard voices and new meanings, just as he did when he looked at the marks of language on the page. As he walked, he began to draw in his book. His experience of the landscape became his experience of his own drawings of the landscape. He groped to understand the source of the mysterious craftsmanship that had revealed these monumental forms. Could his hand learn the river's cursive? Could he speak with the voice of the red rocks? This compulsion to know led him to poke and pry, to force his way into the secrets held by the landscape. What was he digging for? A crystal that would be the material manifestation of a perfect mathematical order? The philosopher's stone? Mineral pigments for magical art? With his magnifying glass, he contemplated the mystery of the relationship between part and whole. Every whole, made up of parts, is itself part of a larger whole. A recursive structuring that cascades through scales from the quantum to galactic foam. He saw the geology of the canyon as a coded history of the complex gravity dance between the spinning earth and her spherical partners. Celestial bodies that were not mere isolated balls of stuff, but nodes of vibration and a resonant system that entered into the full spectrum of earth's being. On the morning of the fourteenth day, meditation brought a spontaneous visualization of the five regular solids of antiquity, a progression which his mind had learned to finger through as if they were beads strung on a prayer mala. The culmination of his meditation was a complex but perfectly coherent geometry of intersecting vector lines covering a sphere which he took to be the whole earth. On the fifteenth night, 
the black sun appeared to him in a dream. The light of the black sun was subtle at first, like the onset of deja vu. But once perceived, the perception gained strength. What he experienced seemed as objectively real as the desert around him. But at the same time, it was inside him, part of his mental landscape. If he made any move to gather evidence of it, it disappeared. If he would know it, he would simply have to watch and open himself to it. His drawings began to show openings into caves and fissures that led into a deeper interior, hidden from the light that defined the world to his eyes, but alive with the energy of the black sun. The black sun refused to simply hand over its meaning, yet it loomed large in his mind, the rubric of his quest. Even as he walked on the uneven terrain among the water flow shaped red rocks, his feet remembered the regular parallel planking of hardwood floors in the rooms that had incubated him, the architectural lines and intervals of the buildings in which he had lived. He wanted to commune with a pure earth landscape untouched by the human but he found that his very presence was a contaminant. It was as though machines and bizarre geometric structures leapt automatically from his city-bred mind, infused with the technological novelties of the industrial world. And yet, for all of that, something in him knew this sensuously feminine landscape Something here spoke directly to his body. In certain places the water and the rock collaborated to offer up erotic shapes, smooth swirls of thigh and hip, all the female landscapes that were in him. As he drew them, they provoked his mind into quiet hallucinatory visions. Their forms spontaneously developed mutative offspring and pulled the zoom lens of his eye toward abstract patterns that might be fractal codes transmitted from another scale. As he repeatedly drew from the contours of the geologic dialogue between water, wind, and rock, it felt as if his hand could remember an ancient language, an earth language buried in somatic memory. Here the earth had spoken, a glossolalia of biological forms and folded them into sheaves of rock. Were there ancient languages of light based on perfect waveforms of energy? Were the ancient men of the canyon infused with earth language and the knowledge of the black sun? He felt a tingling warmth seep into him from the soles of his feet, and a voice arose within him. He vibrated with an ecstatic chant. He shouted a spontaneous call to the canyon, and the canyon answered, answered, answered.